weren't here, soul shift is this, this series about our souls, about that inward place that we have, that, that place that God really wants surrendered to Him. This is a series less about what God has done for us, so, and that's very important. That's extremely important. That's what we just pray about. God, God saved us from our sins. He sent Jesus here, and let us not forget that. But this isn't just about what God has done for us. It's about what God wants to do in us. It's about how he's, that's just the starting point. When you've come to faith in Christ, that he wants to move you forward. For those of you here that haven't even made that decision yet, I want you to hear this series because I want you to see that it doesn't just stop with surrendering your life to Christ. It actually begins there. And that what you maybe haven't seen before is possible in your heart and your life. God can actually change you and move you, shift you from one place where you're doing things and you're acting ways and you're saying things and you're doing all these things that you know you shouldn't do. We all know we do those things each and every week. And rather than filling your life with guilt, rather than filling your life with disappointment, that God actually has a shift in mind for your soul on the inside that, that transfers from the inside to the outside and changes you into the person you'd love to be. The person that's complete, the person that's fully human, the person that is like Jesus. That's what this soul shift is all about. And last week we learned that the reason this can happen, the reason if we engage these shifts we're talking about, that God's grace will penetrate everything. That His grace, His free gift of love, not only has saved you from your sins, but it can penetrate everything and every place in your life. Every place in your soul, every place in your emotions, everything that you've ever been through, past, present, and future. His grace, His love can transform it, can take what is broken, what is dark, what is, what is uh, killing you, what is, brings death to you, and He can bring life. He can make something incredible from it. It is a shift initiated by Him. And if we enter into this, if we accept it, He wants to shift our souls, the change in our inside. Oh my. Mm -hmm. It'll show up on the outside in ways that we can't even start to imagine. So today we're going to talk about our first shift, a shift that's very easy to see in our day-to-day -day life. A shift that I just saw this week that needed to happen, and uh, it, I saw it through this picture. It wasn't this picture, this is a picture of where I saw it. Does anybody recognize where this is? The blue root. The blue root. <laughs> saw, yeah. The blue root and root one. Okay? Now, I don't know if you can see this show up, but um, uh, on this side and this side, the stoplights, and it says one vehicle per grade. Now I want us just, now I'm, I'm, I'm new, still newish to the area, so maybe some of you are really used to this, but do we understand that, I've, I've never seen this before ever in my life until I moved to this area, do we understand that through traffic lights we have to make people take turns? Okay, just let that sink in. That we've gotten to the place where when two lanes merge to one, we have to put a traffic light on either side of the road so that people will take turns. Church, this is something we should have learned in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> right? Am I wrong? I mean, that's probably like kindergarten 101. Share. Take turns. But no, man, something when we get behind the vehicle, when we get behind the wheel of the vehicle, no, I'm not giving that person an inch. So we got to put a traffic light in so that we will take turns. I've got to be honest, it works pretty well. What this does is this exposes the shift that we need to have in our hearts and our lives. Because we have a tendency, all of us, no matter who you are this morning, we have a tendency to put ourselves first. We have a tendency to think only of ourselves. We have a tendency to cut in line or not let somebody else cut in front of us. Because, oh my goodness, that, is, that extra car length... That's unheard of. We have a tendency to, uh, you know, I've said this before, if you don't think we have this tendency, find me a two-year-old that says yours instead of mine. <laughs> it's inbred inside of us. Gangs. Gangs have turf. There's turf wars all over our cities. The suburbs have fences. So don't think we're out of it. I, you know, quick aside here, and for those of you who don't know, I spent 10 years as a police officer. And I spent, some, I spent most of that time in Washington, D.C., but towards the end of my career, I moved up here in Pennsylvania, and I policed in the suburbs. And you know what a common call I had in the suburbs was? This is, this is a true story. Oh. My neighbor, when he mows the property line, is shooting the grass onto my side of the yard. 
I'd love to tell you I only handled one of those calls one time, but I'd be lying to you. It was a frequent call, and it wasn't just the same person. We have a tendency to think of ourselves. We have a tendency to put ourselves first and not think about others. Why? Pretty simple. Sin. Mm. There's places in our there's places in our Bibles where the word sin actually could be translated selfishness. Inwardly, we are bent towards selfishness. Boy, you just all love to hear that, don't you? But it's true. It's, it's who we are. You know, an infant cries in a bottle, and they cry for a bottle if you've ever had an infant. They're not thinking about anything but them. It's just the way it is. Teenagers, teenagers, they don't think about others. They usually obsess about their looks, obsess about what other people are thinking of them. Adults, we obsess about our careers. We obsess about advancement. We obsess about finances. Those things can become such such a uh, focus of our lives that we choose to ignore everything else or we don't, we don't actually engage with those that are around us. We're hardwired for self-preservation, self-advancement, self-comfort. We're hardwired to be self-centered. We have a genetic flaw, folks, and it's called selfishness. Here are the symptoms of selfishness. In case you don't think that you're selfish this morning. First one is this. We have a critical spirit. Sometimes... <laughs> Probably not you, but sometimes I will fully admit this. We think that other people's ideas aren't as good as ours. Amen! Because they are ours. <laughs> so you're about to get some... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, so I know, we look out for ourselves. We look out for ourselves first. If you don't believe this, I will hand you a group photo that you're in, and you tell me who you look for first in that photo. <laughs> Every time. You look for yourselves first. We have low self-esteem. This is actually a sign of selfishness. We don't think we're good enough. We don't think we look good enough. We don't think our performance is as good as other people. We're always thinking about ourselves in comparison to other people. I'm going to tell you, in the social media world, this gets even better. There are some of you out here that thumb through this, and you're constantly comparing your life to other people. So, self-esteem has a problem. We can't forgive ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves. Do you realize that there are people in the room right now, and I'm not telling you this to make you feel guilty, I'm just letting you know, there are people in the room right now who cannot forgive yourself even though God has already forgiven you. Mm. It's almost as if you're saying that my version of forgiveness is more important than God's. We're bent towards selfishness. We're competitive. We're competitive because some of us, we would believe that losing would be such a scar on our on who we are that we couldn't even bear to lose. And don't get me wrong. In fact, if you ever see me on a basketball court, I'll be the first person to be competitive. But we're competitive people. We're self-centered. We talk about ourselves. Also guilty of this. We dominate a conversation. We talk over people. We, we sometimes, when we're in a conversation with somebody, we check out from what they're saying because we're thinking about what we're going to say next. Because what we think we have to add is better than what they're saying. We hold grudges. We don't give forgiveness to people. People do things to us, and we, and we feel, even though we know, if you're a believer, you know that you're to forgive others, you don't forgive other people because you're thinking about what they did to you, how they offended you, how, did they, how they wronged you, and how you deserve to hold a grudge. Because, if, Pastor, if you knew what they did, if you knew what she said, if you knew how he hurt me, you wouldn't be telling me to forgive. All about me. It's what we do. But here's the thing. God knew that this would be tough for our soul. He knew this would be a place where our soul needed shifted. This isn't just true of us. This is true of the 12 disciples. These apostles that followed Jesus. The stories we're about to look at today, I believe, are in our scriptures because this is a common experience. And God wanted us to see that even the 12 apostles, even these guys that followed Jesus for years, were bent towards selfishness. Quick aside to that, I would tell you that I actually think this, these stories, not just these two stories, but stories like this, are one of the greatest evidences that our, our Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are actually true. Because if I was somebody who was a part of these, if I had stories in the scriptures that I knew were going to live on forever, and they painted me in this picture, I would not want them in there whatsoever. 
If I was writing my own story, if I was trying to make something up, I would make myself look as good as possible, right? Because I'm self-centered. But these stories actually show, because I believe God, through His Spirit, wanted the writers of Scripture to show how even the apostles are bent towards self-centeredness. So we look at Mark, and the disciples had just left Galilee, and they were heading toward Jerusalem. When Jesus told them that he said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. So just before this, just before this, Peter had said, you are the Christ. He had just, the apostles for the first time had realized that Jesus is the Son of God, come to save the world. And so Jesus turn, turns from the way he's been teaching, turns from the places he's been, and he lets them in on the mission. He tells them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they're going to kill me. And I'm going to be buried for three days, and I'm going to rise again. Now, we've heard this. Some of us, if you're a Christian in the room today, have heard this a lot of times before. This is the first time the apostles would have heard this. And they were confused, and they didn't understand it. And they, were, they, were, they weren't sure what to think, but they were just walking along Galilee. And they were walking with Jesus, and he told them this, and then he just kept going. Now, you would think they would have a discussion about this. You'd think they would be wondering, okay, so what does this mean? What is he trying to say? What is, who's, who are these people that are, he's going to be delivered onto, into? But, but no. The story goes on. They came to Capernaum where they were headed. And when he was in the house, Jesus, he asked them, hey, what were you arguing about on the road? Maybe Jesus was thinking, were you, were you wondering what I was saying? Were you wondering what I was talking about? Were you wondering how I was going to be delivered over to the hands of men? And it tells us, no, that's not at all. But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Now think about this. Jesus drops a bombshell. For the first time, he tells them why he's here, his purpose, and how he is here in the world, and how he's going to die, how the man they loved, the man they're following, the man they just said was not only man, but God, was going to be delivered into the hands of men. And rather than talk about that, their discussion along the walk was who was greatest. Bent towards selfishness. No one knows what they said. Mark doesn't tell us. Matthew doesn't tell us. Luke doesn't tell us what they said. But I would almost guarantee, and I think you'd agree with me, that each disciple probably argued for themselves, right? I doubt that they all got together to go, oh yeah, John's definitely the greatest of all of us. No, they were all jockeying for their own position. And so Jesus, hearing this, tells them this. Anyone who wants to be first, anyone who wants to be greatest, must be the very last and the servant of all. So if you want to be first, if you want to be the greatest, if you want to be the best, if you want to truly be what I would consider the greatest, you must be last. You must be the servant of everyone. And you would think, at least I would think, that this would be the end of it, wouldn't you? Okay, we got it, Jesus. So later, they are having another discussion with Jesus, and Jesus was talking about his sacrifice for the world again. Just a chapter later in Mark 10, Mark tells us Jesus again for the second time tells them that he's coming, and he's coming, he's going to be delivered over, he's going to die on the cross, and he's going to be buried three days, and he's going to rise again. And you would think after this discussion, where Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be a servant, they would get it. But no, the story tells us that they came, two men, James and John, they were brothers, they came and said to the teacher, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever you ask. Whatever we ask. Now Jesus is probably thinking, oh, I don't know what these guys are going to say, but what do you want me to do for you? He says, I say, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in the Lord. Now folks, i got to tell you, if I was Jesus, I'd probably be like this. You know? I had just had a discussion with you about my life, death, and resurrection, and you wanted to know who was the greatest, and now I've had a second discussion, and you two bozos decided to come over here, away from the other ten, and ask <coughs> if one of you can sit on my right, and one of you can sit on my left in glory. And those are positions of power in this context. These would be the most powerful positions you would have as people that are not the king. This tells us that they understood Jesus' message was he was going to be the king of the universe. And yet they didn't care about, they didn't ask, nobody asked him, what does it mean you're going to suffer? What does it mean you're going to die? No, they wanted a position of glory. They were on the same road with Jesus in both situations, 
but they were on a completely different world. In both cases, Jesus was talking about self-sacrifice, being a servant, and the disciples were exhibiting what were all exhibited, self-centeredness, selfishness, thinking about who they were since they're now following this Jesus guy. They were with Jesus for two years. He had taught them everything that they needed to know to carry on his love, his mission into the world. And yet, they still needed a soul shift. They needed a shift from me to you. And so did we. You and I were the same as the disciples. We think about this. Now, many, many of us may not believe this, or many of us, many of us don't see this in ourselves from a day to day, but we sit in this this place, we hear these words, we read our scriptures, we're in Bible studies and small groups, and we realize God exposes these things to us. And we want to make a shift from being self-centered to be self-sacrificial. But then we just, we go do it. We walk out into the world, we start thinking about ourselves again. We need this shift from me. We need the Holy Spirit to come in our hearts and change us. Jesus obviously didn't need this. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was curved outward. He was always thinking of other people. He came not to be served, but to be a ransom for many, he says. He came to be the one who died. Jesus is not in need of a shift for me to you, but if we want to be like Jesus, we are. Look what Paul says about Jesus. Paul tells us that we are to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. See, Paul says, if we're going to be the same as Jesus, we need to realize Jesus was God and man. He was God in a body. He was Jesus, the Son of God, who had came to earth, and he was both at the same time. Both. And yet, what did he do? Someone who deserved to be self-centered, someone who deserved to be bowed down to, he was literally God. And yet, what did he do? He didn't figure that because he was God, he should be he should use it to his advantage. When he was drawn on a cross, when he was whipped with chains, when he was asked to die for the sins of the world, did he use that to his advantage? No, in fact, there's one place where he tells Pilate, if I wanted to, I could call down angels and destroy everything, but I'm not going to do that. My kingdom's not of this world, and I have another plan. I'm not going to use my power, my abilities, who I am, to my own advantage. No, this is what I'm going to do. Rather, he made himself Nothing. Say that. He made himself what? Nothing. Nothing. Who of us ever would want to make ourselves? Nothing. Most of us spend our entire lives trying to become something. But John, Jesus says, the shift from me to you, Jesus says, I want you to make yourself nothing. <clears throat> and he took on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man, he, what? humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even, even, death on the cross. So how do we shift from me to you? If, if we want to become like Jesus, we want to engage these soul shifts. How do we curve instead of inward focus to outward focus, instead of selfish to self-sacrificial? I think there's four stages to this in our lives, four ways, and, and we're going to be on different stages in this room today. The first stage is this, wake up. Some of you literally wake up. But, um, wake up to it. Realize that you are selfish. And I don't say this to be hurtful, I'm not saying this to harm your hearts. I'm just saying, it's, isn't it true of us? Don't we have this mindset where we think about ourselves? That our whole world, sometimes we think it revolves around us? I tell you, the way that people sometimes realize this the most is, is in stages of their lives when they wake up to it. Like, one, one, one way that people usually wake up to the fact that they're self-centered is when they're newlyweds. Boy, I tell you what, when two become one and then the two become in one house, you realize you're self-centered. Because he doesn't do anything I do. Do you realize he doesn't fold his towels the right way? He leaves his underwear everywhere. He doesn't do dishes. And she just won't leave me alone. And she doesn't understand that Sunday between 1 and 11 p.m. is the most important time in the entire year between September and February. Right? And we get angry about these things. 
Or when you have a baby for the first time, you realize how selfish you are. Now let's, let's cut to the chase here. None of us want to admit this, but I will admit this. We love our children, we love babies very much. But there is a point in time, about month two, when you have a newborn, where you go, oh my gosh, will they just stay asleep? <laughs> Because I can't take it anymore. I just need another hour. Please. Right? These are those, these are those steps where we expose our selfishness. Um, first time missionaries. When I, was a, when I was a youth pastor, boy, nothing exposed the selfishness of our youth than taking them someplace without any Wi-Fi, cell phone coverage, without bathrooms that flushed and showers that were not part of a, part of a waterfall or at least a steady stream of water. Yeah, we went to this. We went to this one. Uh, we went to this one mission trip where the showers had a chain, so you had to hold the chain, you know, to, to let the water go. And man, you would think for these teenage girls that I was asking them to sacrifice one of their own children. That's how big of a deal this was. These are the things that happen in our lives that expose how self-centered we are, how entitled we feel, and you'll feel these places along the way. Some of you are going to have. Times along the way. Sometimes it's going to be a sermon. Sometimes it's going to be a moment in time. Sometimes it's going to be a mistake that you made with a child or a coworker or a spouse. And let me let me explain to you. When you wake up to these moments, when you feel these moments, when these the reality of your selfishness seems in that moment to be exposed, this is what you need to do. You need to invite Jesus to shift your soul. Because you have two choices in that moment. You can ignore it, or you can say, Jesus, you know what? I realize I have a brokenness inside of me. I'm self-centered. And you know what? Jesus can change that through his Holy Spirit. And each time you feel one of those moments, you invite him into it and say, Lord, oh my goodness, I barely stand myself right now. Will you help me with this? Stage two, intentional interest. This is the second stage. Once you realize that you're selfish, that you're bent towards selfishness, stage two is taking intentional interest in others. Because if you have a bent towards selfishness, you're not going to do it naturally. That's just the way it is. Because you're only going to be thinking about yourself. And here's the thing. Our lives are busy, are they not? There's deadlines, there's obligations, there's, there's things to do, there's places to go, there's kids' practices, and there's, there's all these things we're running around every single day. Pretty soon... We don't even see the people around us. So how can we ever be others focused? If you want to take intentional interest, this is what you're going to have to do. There's no other way. You're going to have to slow down. You're going to have to. There's no other way you're going to be able to see the needs of the people around you. And folks, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if he lives inside of you, you have the greatest gift in the world to offer people. And if, if every, every person in this room walks out these doors, slows down, and takes an intentional interest in their fellow man, boy, we can do an amazing things for the kingdom of God. It's a funny thing. I mentioned earlier I was a police officer. One of the things that's kind of an unwritten role in police work is that the older the cop, the slower they drive to a scene. Now, maybe some of you would think that's laziness, but that's not the case. You see, young policemen and women... They will, when they get a call, an emergency or a, a victim needs help, they will fly there, Mach 1, as fast as they can. Power like, you know, right in. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> There's been so many times when I would train police officers, they would drive right past the victim. You know, they get on the radio, you know, county, I can't find the victim anywhere. And then, you know, some old salty police officer would be like, he's back here at the corner of blah, 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 blah. And the reason why... The reason why they always rushed to the scene is because they were excited, because they were busy, because they, the, the adrenaline kicked in, whatever. And, but the older officers knew that the slower you went, the more you were able to see everything. And actually going slower was faster because it, it accomplished the mission. Folks, if you want to be others focused, if you want to shift from me to you, we have to be people who are willing to slow down and take an intentional interest in the world around us. To be able to see the people that are in need. We need to be able to say in the grocery store parking lot, Father, I know I'm running in here for a dozen eggs and a gallon of milk, but if there is somebody here in this grocery store that needs the love of Jesus Christ, that needs a touch, that needs a prayer, that needs to see that there's hope in this world, I have the hope of God, or the hope of the world inside me. 
Use me in this moment. I'm going to pray that I'm going to look, Lord, and through your spirit, speak right now to me as I go in here so that I can be good news to somebody through your power today. If we don't do that, then people think that this faith that we have is useless, that it's just about gathering here. No, it's gathering here so that when we're scattered, we take with us the kingdom of God. Intentional interest. Stage three is become a servant. When we take interest in people, we're still in charge. And there's a way that if we take interest in people, we can say, I'm not taking people in interest. And I get to choose who I'm going to serve and who I'm not. And I get to choose whether you're worthy of being served or not. No, the shift, the shift here in stage three is a shift that I am a servant of all, no matter what. Even people that don't look like me, people that don't believe what I do, people that I know that are walking in sin, I am going to be a servant. I'm going to follow Jesus, who, though he was same, the same as God, chose not to use that as his, as his advantage. Instead, he made himself, remember what that word was? I'm nothing. The stage three of becoming a servant is realizing that to follow Jesus, the first must be last. And you must have a mindset that I am nothing, and what I have and who I am is nothing compared to what Jesus wants to do for me. And rather than saying, I'm serving people because I am the, I am the white knight that can go in and save the world. No, we're saying, I'm a servant of the world, the servant of God goes high, and I am here to love people the way that God wants me to. We give up the right to be in charge. We make ourselves vulnerable. And we do small things in hidden places that give us no credit or no reward. To become a servant, I think, means to go after the small stuff. Very few of us will ever do anything that gets us on the front front of the news page. Very few of us will ever do anything that gets us accolades from from society. But many of us will do, and think about this in your own life, many of us with a servant heart will do small things in small places for people that may think their need is insignificant. But in the moment that you take a servant's heart towards what they need, where they are, how they need to see Jesus, it will change their life. Think about the times in your life. Some of those worst times that you've gone through. Think about the moments in life where you've lost someone where you've needed somebody, where you've had one of those days that literally from the beginning of the day you should have stayed in bed. And somebody does just one small thing. Maybe they let you in line. Maybe they buy you a cup of coffee. Maybe they come up to you and say, give you a compliment. Maybe they find you and pray for you. I'll tell you I'm going to pray for you. They actually pray for you. They send you a note. None of these things are rocket science things. None of these things are things that will change the world. But I tell you what, when you become a servant, when you go after the small stuff, you may change someone's day. You may change someone's life. To become a servant means to go after the small stuff. But you've got to wake up to the fact that you're bent towards yourself. You've got to slow down. And you've got to be willing to find the small stuff and be willing to step out in faith to the love of Jesus. The fourth stage that I want to talk about this morning is to make it fun and make it family. You see, because when we talk about self-sacrifice, when we talk about being self-centered, when we talk about what we need to do, we think we can think, oh my gosh, Dan, do you have any idea what my life is like? Do you have any idea what my week is like? Oh, thanks, Pastor. Now you just added in another thing on my to-do list every single day. This is going to be impossible. It may sound good for you, buddy, up there standing there preaching about it, but it ain't going to work for me because you have no idea what my day's like. Listen, we can be tempted, all of us can be tempted to think the shift from me to you is just another thing. No, it is what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you and make you become a servant. And as someone who is a servant, who realizes this is part of what God wants to do in you and through you, it can be fun. You can be creative. You can look for ways, small ways, to help people. And if it's something that's attached to something you already have fun doing, then it'll be easier to serve that way. If it's attached to a hobby, if it's attached to something that you enjoy, then figure out a way you can use that to serve people. Also, make it family. Make it family. First way we've talked about this before, another word for family in the New Testament is oikos. 
And so maybe it is with your small group. Maybe it is with, with a, her people in the church. Because I've met people in the church. We call ourselves a church family, right? Serve together. Serve together. But for some of you, it may be family. For you parents in the room, I want to let you know that one of the reasons why our children walk away from faith, study after study have shown it, is because they see what we are taught in church and then they see what you do at home and they're not the same. And what you do and how you feel about your faith is far more impactful than any sermon I would ever preach. And no matter what stage your child is in, you can make it family. Grandparents, no matter how old your children are, you can have them bring their children along. When we take it, uh, when we, we take a mindset, okay, I'm going to involve my family, I'm going to involve other people, whether it's church family or it's biological family, in serving. Not only are we already engaging in what God wants us to do, the shift from media, but we're also helping our children shift through God's power no matter what stage they're in. Just little tiny things you can do as a family. So I helped you out. And on, this, on this side of the stage here, there's, there's a, a sheet. On the front here, it says grade school. On the back, it says nursery and preschool. And if you have children that are in those age groups, come on and pick them up today. They're just small things that you can do, that you can do with your family. If you have grandchildren, ways that you can actually make it family. If you're not uh, interested in that, I have just a simple thing. It's called Steps Towards Neighborhood Mission. Small things you can do in your neighborhood, right around your neighbors, with your family in the church, with yourself at home. Ways that you can take a step to shift from me to you. Fun ways that you can do small things that add up to a big difference. So we want to make sure that when we wake up to the fact that we're selfish, we invite Jesus to change our hearts and our lives. And we, when we realize that we're bent that way and in stage two, we want to slow down. We want to take intentional interest in others. We want to see what other, what, what other needs there are. Stage three, we, obviously, we want, to, we want to make sure that we have servant's heart. Make ourselves nothing. Realize that we're not owed anything by what we do. We may never get a thank you, but when we do the small things as a servant, we may change people's days. We may change people's lives through Jesus. And finally, we want to make it fun. We get family. This isn't to add to it. This, is, this isn't to add to your life. This is to bring something into your life that God wants to see. He wants to see a shift from me to you. When we shift from me to you, here's what's going to happen. First, we're going to ask questions like, what will I do with my life? We ask that question all the time. What is the purpose of my life? No, when we make this shift, we'll start asking the question, where can I better serve people with my life? When we think, we often we think about, does that project or does that program or does that church actually deserve my money? When we make a shift from me to you, it, it, it'll look like this. That person, that cause, needs my money more than I do. When we make a shift from you to me to you, when we pray, instead of saying, God, let me tell you about all my problems, we say, God, let me tell you about someone who needs your help. This is what a shift from me to you looks like. For those of you who are reading the book, you'll recognize this story, but I'm going to close with this. Uh, in the, uh, William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was asked to speak at this major event for the Salvation Army. People from all over the world were coming. And all of them were really looking forward to hearing him give this keynote address. But it turns out before he showed up to this convention, William Booth was too sick to come. So he made the arrangement. I'm going to send you my speech so that you can share it for me. Someone can read it. So the people, were, the people that were organizing the event were really excited to receive what he was going to say and hear what he was going to say as if somebody read it aloud, but he didn't send a letter, he didn't send a book, he didn't send a speech, he sent a telegram with one word. Others. Others. A shift from me to you is a shift to others focused. 